Uh, please welcome Jaya, who's going to tell us all about random module. Thank you. So, non sequitur an exploration of Python's random module. Um, non sequitur means it does not follow in Latin. And I chose it as the name of the talk because it sort of describes the behavior of uh, random sequences, but also because my own interest in the topic uh, was completely random. Uh, so it, it does not have much practical relevance for me, but still I think it's an interesting and beautiful topic and uh, worth talking about. So my name is Jair Trejo. Uh, I work for Bingo Orbis, a small development shop in Mexico City. Um, and I want to talk to you today about randomness in computers and in the Python standard library. So I like the English word random uh, because besides its basic, basic meanings of uh, unpredictability and impartiality, it also has a connotation of uh, spontaneity or suddenness. Uh, in fact, it likely comes from old French words that meant things like speed or violence or impulsiveness. The Spanish word is azar. Uh, it comes from Arabic, and it refers to an old dice game. So even now, we call uh, chance games juegos de azar. So the mathematical term is very much related to the uh, gambling uh, meaning. So it is no coincidence that the first explorations of probability, the mathematical theory that measures, analyzes, and to a point predicts random outcomes, uh, has its roots on... Uh, trying to understand gambling and what, what goes into predicting uh, the outcome of gambling. Um, one of the first examples of probabilistic analysis comes from a series of letters between Isaac Newton and uh, Samuel Pepys, the president of the Royal Society, concerning some dice bets uh, that Samuel Pepys was going to make. Uh, we think of the rolling of dice as a process with a random outcome. Uh, for a fair die, uh, we hope that each of the six faces has an equal probability to come up when we're running it. Uh, so before throwing it, we don't really know what is it going to come up. Uh, and even when we do a series of rolls, the information about past uh, outcomes of the dice does not give us any insight into what is going to come next. So if I roll the dice and the number four comes up, is four a random number? Well, it certainly is a number chosen at random, but just by looking at it, we cannot know whether the process that produced it was actually random. So we can't really talk about the randomness of individual numbers, but about sequences of numbers. And sequences of random numbers have many applications in real-world situations. Um, they are often used for reducing the size of a problem by, by sampling it at, at uh, random points. Uh, this can be seen, for instance, in uh, statistics where you take a representative sample from a population, like when you pick people to call from an election poll, or in simulations where you want to approximate uh, some, the probability from, for some event or property, uh, we can randomly generate events and then statistically measure uh, the probability that we're looking for. These applications require the sequence of random numbers to be uniformly distributed. Uh, so this means that every number in a certain range needs to come up with roughly equal probability. Or otherwise our result is going to exhibit uh, those same biases. Uh, for instance, this sequence, uh, it looks pretty random, reasonably uniform. Uh, so it can conceivably be used in simulations as a source of numbers between zero and nine. Uh, in fact, if we try and take the average, uh, we will see that it's reasonably around 4.5. That is what we will expect uh, for such a short sequence. And every number comes up roughly with the same frequency. Um, but random numbers also have important applications in cryptography. Uh, many, secure uh, many secure communication algorithms uh, use random numbers uh, for secret generation uh, so that only trusted parties will notice the secret random numbers. Uh, cryptographic signing schemes also use random numbers for generating signatures in a way that doesn't reveal information about the key, even if you have a lot of uh, signet messages. And for instance, in Django, 
there is a, a long random secret key that you need to use for every website that is used to sync uh, sessions and encrypting them so that uh, users or attackers cannot tamper with them. Uh, and there's been a recent scandal about the NSA back in, making a trapdoor in the random number generator used by uh, RSA in many of their products. So apparently they can predict which uh, random numbers the RSA products are picking, which has disastrous security implications. So these cryptographic applications require, most, uh, require more than just an unbiased sequence of numbers. They require the sequence of numbers to be actually unpredictable. Uh, an attacker that knows which random numbers I'm picking, or even that has some insight on, the, on the, where to look for the random numbers that I'm picking, uh, has the door open to all of my secrets. So the sequence we were talking about just before, it looks unpredictable, maybe, but it really isn't at all. So they are the first digits of pi, which of course is a completely fixed uh, predictable sequence. If an attacker knew that I was using uh, digits from pi for generating random numbers, he will only have to compute pi and he will know all of my future pickings. So keeping in mind these two requirements of impartiality and unpredictability, uh, what can we use for getting suitable sequences of random numbers? Um, one option is to use uh, natural phenomena that we know uh, to be unpredictable when measured with sufficient accuracy. Uh, for instance, the website random.org uses atmospheric noise. Uh, it measures it and extracts random numbers from it. Uh, in the UK, there is a machine called Ernie that uh, uses transistor noise measurements uh, to pick winners in a national lottery. And we can also use radioactive uh, isotope decay which we know is by nature unpredictable and uh, independently, uh, independently of the precision of our instruments or even the quality of our models. But what these cases have in common is that it is often uh, slow, expensive, and require uh, of uh, specialized equipment to measure uh, the sort of natural quantities to generate random numbers. So it might be useful to generate this, uh, a large quantity of random numbers once and then compiling this into a table of random numbers that we can draw from uh, in the future. As a matter of fact, in 1955, uh, the Rand Corporation published a table of a million random digits obtained from specialized uh, hardware. Uh, this enormous book came to be widely used in simulations for uh, engineering and science. But uh, of course, n large numeric tables also have some disadvantages of their own. Uh, especially with the computers from back then, it is very hard to store and efficiently uh, access such a, such a large table, uh, which led researchers to look into techniques uh, for random number generation in, on the fly. So, of course, computers are deterministic artifacts. So, the future state of the machine is completely determined by the present state. So, how can an algorithm actually generate random numbers? Um, well, it turns out that unless we incorporate input from outside devices, uh, we can only generate pseudo-random numbers. That is, uh, random number generators, output numbers that look random when statistically measuring them, uh, but they are not actually hard to predict if you have enough information about the, uh, the state of the generator. Um, in the 1940s, John Ben Newman was doing simulation work uh, that require a stream of random numbers. He came up with the idea of generating it by taking a random number, squaring it, and then taking the, f uh, the middle digits to produce next. Um, the output of the generator looks reasonably random, but it is crucial to pick the right seed, for, because for instance, if we get a zero somewhere in there, uh, that means that from then on, the sequence is going to generate a zero. Um, and it also has a tendency to devoid into, to, or, or to fall into short loops, um, which of course there is no way to getting out of. Um, in fact, we can use different seeds and measure uh, just how long does the generator run before starting to repeat numbers. And we can see that even for 40 digits, 
the sequences are not very long. Um, but if we take one of those long sequences and check their average value and other statistical properties, we can see that they look uh, reasonably random. So is it possible to evaluate randomness more precisely? Uh, if we want to mathematically evaluate randomness, we need ways to formalize both its impartiality and its unpredictability aspects. Um, a way to formally measure um, unpredictability is to look at the entropy of our output, uh, which is a measure of the space of possibilities that it can take. Um, it is important to know that this cannot be immediately told from uh, looking at the numbers. You, ha you have to actually look into the process that generated them. For instance, if we see those numbers and I told you that I picked them at random, you might think that I picked them uh, in a range from zero to, to, from zero to uh, 100. Uh, but if I told you that they are actually uh, prime numbers, then you will see that the actual space from which where I draw them was much smaller than without. Um, it's similar to how my bank asked me to pick a password, but it only can be like eight characters long and I cannot use repeating patterns or consecutive numbers. So in general, they are reducing and reducing the space of possible passwords that they can pick. Although it might be worth it, it is, if it stops people from using password as a ranking password. Um, as for impartiality, we can look at, at the statistical properties of our random sequence and see if they are uh, consistent with probabilistic predictions. Uh, when checking the randomness of the digits of pi, we used the very informal test, sort of a rule of thumb. Uh, we checked that the average of the values was what was to be expected uh, in the random sequence. And we strengthened this test by looking at individual frequencies for different digits and see that they are roughly the same. Um, but we don't have much elements to assess whether this is sufficiently right or, or, or disastrously wrong. Um, we need something a little bit more quantitative. A much better evaluation is the chi-square test, which is used in the statistics to see if a set of data conforms to a certain distribution. Uh, the general idea is to measure the squares of the difference between real and expected values, weighted by the expected value, um, and summing them. So this gives us a sort of a measure of how much our observed frequencies deviates from uh, what we would expect uh, probabilistically in the real one. With this measure, we go to a table like this that uh, gives us the likelihood of observing uh, different values of this quantity. Um, if it is too, too big, then we, 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 we conclude that uh, the sequence is too, is too different or, or is too much deviated from uh, what we will expect in a random sequence. Uh, but also, and different from uh, the application in statistics, if it is too low, then the, the sequence is also suspect to be too uh, uniform for being random. Um, other tests check the sequence for more complex patterns. For instance, in a random sequence, pairs of numbers need to be as uh, uniformly distributed as numbers themselves. Or we can also check if there are gaps between successive appearances of the same number and whether the length of these gaps is consistent with what we would expect uh, probabilistically. And there's also a number of other patterns uh, that we can use. As a matter of fact, there are standard tests uh, that can be used to check random sequences. Um, there is one by the American NIST which group a series of conventional mathematical tests as a series of programs that can evaluate uh, a list of random numbers. So we can see if our generators are random enough. Um, on the other hand, there's some more exotic tests like the Marsaglia diehard battery tests uh, that, prove that uh, tests random numbers in some quirky situations like uh, the spacing of birthdays in a random population or it tries to place circles and see which circles overlap in a plane. Um, and many other uh, random experiments that we know what, to, what values to expect. 
Uh, and we can check that against the performance of our random or supposedly random sequence. Uh, taking into account these tests of randomness, better generators have been devised. One very popular is the linear congruential generator, which is a recurrence where we take an initial value and use this equation to produce subsequent values. Uh, of course, this is going to eventually repeat itself uh, with a period no greater than m. But if we pick the right values for a, c, and m, we can, uh, we can get reasonably large sequences that exhibit very good uh, statistical properties. Uh, the problem with this algorithm is that it's very easy to fall into this situation. Uh, even if numbers look random when seen linearly, when you plot pairs of them, they sometimes exhibit this kind of behavior, like they are all falling in, in the same straight lines. Uh, we can choose better A, C, and M's um, to, to get rid of this behavior, but it, it always ends up happening in higher dimensions. Um, so how can we get rid of even these uh, deviations from truly random uh, behavior? Well, the Mersenne Twister is an algorithm uh, proposed by Makoto Matsumoto and Takuji Nishimura which consists of a large linear feedback register. Um, and it operates in a way that permits the sequence to have a very, very large period of two to the 19 or 20,000 potency, more, more or less. Um, it is also interesting that this sequence has internal state and it uses that internal state to produce the actual random numbers. So even if you know the random numbers themselves, uh, you cannot predict immediately uh, the next number in the sequence. You need a large uh, sample of them. Um, and if you actually measure the statistical properties of the sequence uh, that it uh, produces, they are very, very close to randomness, uh, and they don't exhibit or, or, or um, these, these weird correlations in, in many dimensions uh, up to 623 dimensions. So it is a very good random number generator. Uh, these desirable characteristics have made it a very popular generator. It is baked in in many languages. Uh, Python is one of them. Uh, the Python random noodle uses Marsan Twister as its underlying default uh, number, ran random number generator. Um, there's also the question of how to get random numbers that are cryptographically secure. Uh, this obviously cannot be obtained from an algorithm because algorithms are deterministic. Uh, so they have to be gathered from system activity. Uh, Linux and some other Unix systems provide a source of random numbers in dev random uh, that is uh, fed by an entropy pool that derives randomness from various sources like uh, keyboard inputs or the timing of mouse movements, noise in uh, sound or network interfaces, etc. Uh, so when users, are gener uh, gener uh, when users need random numbers, they can get true random numbers from this pool. Uh, of course, getting random numbers out of the pool sort of drink a bit of our entropy milkshake. So we need to replenish the pool with more entropy. Um, besides the regular sources for a consumer system, like the keyboard or the mouse, uh, modern computer systems often incorporate some form of hardware random number generation. Uh, Intel chips, the EV Bridge family, uh, come with a uh, dedicated random number generator in the hardware. Um, so now we have finally arrived to the actual random <laughs> module. Um, the, the Python's random module uh, starts from this uh, generator of numbers between 0 and 1, uh, uniformly distributed, and provides a lot of other interesting distributions uh, based on that. So the way to use it is there is a class in the module, random, which can be seeded, uh, and that provides a method random that is going to produce a sequence of numbers uh, from zero to one. Um, if we can use the seed if we are going to repeat or we need the same sequence or to use the same sequence several times. If we don't, then we can just let uh, Python seeded with uh, a number get from dev u random or from the number of seconds at the time of the call. Uh, 
from real random numbers between 0 and 1, it is very easy to get uh, real uh, or integer random numbers uh, up to a certain number. We just multiply the random real by the maximum value. If you have a specific range, uh, you have to generate a random number up to the width of the range and then offset it by the start. So it is still very easily, very easily uh, derivated from the random real. And if you also need uh, a certain step in this sequence of possible random numbers, um, you just generate an integer up to the number of steps and then offset it by start and you have your random integer. Uh, so we can generate random reals, we can generate random integers, and if we need to include uh, the, cl the, the, the whole interval of numbers, so, so we, we need a number between a and b, including a and b, we can use this special function, randint, that just calls rand range with the appropriate arguments. Uh, we can also pick, uh, or we can also perform some operations, or random operations in a sequence. For instance, we might want to get a random element in the sequence, which is very easy. You just uh, generate an integer uh, in the range of indexes for the sequence and pick uh, the element corresponding to that index. If we need a sample, uh, we just repeat this process several times. If we want a sample without replacement, we need uh, some form of tracking of which numbers we have already uh, picked. Um, there are two ways to do it. You can track which numbers you can still pick in a list and then remove from them every time you pick one. Or you can use a set to remember which numbers you have already picked. Uh, which is more efficient depends on the size of the population compared to the size of the sample that you want to get. And the Python random module actually computes this on the fly and uses the more efficient method. You also might want to shuffle the list um, the, the algorithm used by the random module is the feature Jade's shuffle, which just goes to the list and exchange uh, every item with a randomly picked uh, with another one that is randomly picked. If we need it, uh, this, of course, destroys the sequence. Uh, so, if we need uh, a simpler way to do it that gives us a new list, we can just sort by a random key. This is not as efficient but uh, it's much more simple. Now, we might be interested in random real numbers that have another distribution other than the uniform one. Uh, how might we go about it? Well, let's consider the normal distribution. Uh, it is determined by two parameters, mu and sigma. And in this plot, we can see that for each real number, we can know the probability of picking it uh, with, this, with this normal distribution. Um, but we can also plot the probability of uh, a random variable with this distribution falling before every real number. Uh, this is called the cumulative, distributive, the, the cumulative distribution function for the variable, and we can see that it's always increasing. Um, this means that to get a sequence of normally distributed random numbers, we can generate a uniform random number uh, or that will be the uniform that we will use as the probability in this plot, and then we can check to the, what x does that probability corresponds, uh, and the result of that selection is going to be uh, normally distributed. This does not only apply to the normal distribution, but to any distribution for which we know uh, the distributing function. Uh, but it is not uh, always obvious or easy to generate the inverse uh, cumulative distribution function just from looking at the distribution function. Um, so there are many mathematical tricks that have been devised to ease these computations. Um, so for instance, or for the normal variate distribution, um, we use sort of a mathematical trick where we pick two random numbers, use them to generate a point in a circle, and the x and y coordinates of that point uh, end up being uh, normally distributed. And from there, we can get a number of interesting distributions uh, that, we might, that you might know from science and engineering, like the triangular distribution, gamma and beta distributions, 
uh, the Pareto distribution or the Weevil distribution that is very popular in engineering because it's, uh, it can be used to approximate the other ones. Um, another one of note is the von Mises distribution that is sort of the, like the normal distribution but for angles in a circle. Because when we have angles, we can see that several angles may actually correspond to the same point in the, in the circle. So the von Mises distribution, it's wrapped around the circle to consider the effect of this, uh, of this like double uh, angles for every point. And finally, the random middle creates a default instance of the random class and provides the bounded methods as module methods. So you can just import random, and if you don't care about the state of the generator, you can just use uh, the module functions. Uh, if you need separate generators, like for multi-threading applications, or uh, because you need two independent generators for different experiments, you can actually instance the class uh, and treat them individually. You can also subclass the random class to provide your own random number generator. Um, the Python random module comes with the Wigman heel for uh, backwards compatibility reasons and as an example of how to provide your own random number generator. Uh, there's also system random that will uh, get numbers from the system provided random number generator in, in Unix systems. And there is even a library that will connect to the random.org server and use that as a source for random numbers. So if you need true random numbers, you can use this. Uh, and since all of the other methods rely only on uh, this generator of, now of real numbers from zero to one, um, they will still work even if changing the source of the actual numbers. So, concluding, the definition of randomness is more philosophical than a mathematical problem. But we can use mathematical definitions that are useful for our purposes. Uh, if you need sequences that are deterministic, but behave as if random, we can use pseudo-random number generation. Uh, but if we need numbers that are completely unpredictable, we need sources of entropy, like input devices, noise measurements, or other external natural phenomena. And for most of our random number needs, Python provides more than adequate capabilities. Uh, finally, I would like to talk about a book that inspired this talk. This is a very good book that takes this very short basic program and uses literary criticism techniques uh, to analyze it word by word. Uh, it sounds far-fetched, but it's actually a very interesting book. And the captor of randomness is what got me interesting, interested into uh, this very, very beautiful topic. Um, the Art of Computer Programming, Volume 2. Half of this book is about random numbers. It is very theoretical, but it's also very fun. Uh, lots of really nice mathematics in there. And finally, if you want to read a little bit more, uh, there is a series of really good articles about randomness in cryptography by Clothfair that might help you understand why is randomness important in cryptography. Uh, there is a very good description, in the second link, there is a very good description of uh, how random, of how statistical testing of random numbers work. And if you want to read more about the possible backdoor in the RSA's random number generator, this Ars Technica article is also very good. So that will be it. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>